So thanks, Paul. Uh, as I already mentioned, I'm going to talk about how to kill your golden images in your infrastructure setups. And just give me a little sign. Who's more into system management and system administration than into software development? A couple of you. I'll try to do my best. <laughs> but yeah, please tell me how you liked it afterwards. So uh, as Paul already, already introduced uh, me, my name is Manfred. I live in Austria, in Graz, and I'm a software developer in automotive industry for the last seven years or so. Um, besides my work for the company called KS Engineers, I consider myself being a hobby photographer and a travel enthusiast. In fact, my wife and I have just been to Hawaii and I took an overnight flight here, so I'm really, really tired. So please um, don't uh, bother when I take a sip of my coffee sometimes. <laughs> And if I faint on the stage, just let me rest. I'll probably be asleep. <clears throat> so um, yeah, as Paul already um, told you, I um, uh, consider myself also a Linux advocate. I'm a long time Linux user and probably fanboy would be a better fit. So naturally, package managers and system automation scripting is not something that's really new to me. But yeah, I've just been um, using chocolate tea since summer 2016 because I've been uh, assigned a project at work where I had to restructure and modernize the way we're dealing with our infrastructure, which is both um, for development hosts and development servers. So keep that in mind. Whenever I'm referring to infrastructures, I'll probably be talking about software de development boxes, so mainly PCs and laptops, servers and services. So that's what this talk is going to be about. Yeah. Um, if you've got some questions during your presentation, I'll try to leave some time at the end. Um, so probably remember them, uh, them if possible. Well, um, I tried to concentrate the trash content at the very beginning. So uh, we have more time for the quality stuff later on. If you do not like Star Wars, just bear with me the next couple of minutes, maybe three or so, and then we'll be advancing with the other stuff. So uh, I assume at least all of you have heard of golden images or of master images. Give me a quick sign. Who has never used the image before in software management? Nobody. OK, perfect. So um, just in case, I made up a little story, or uh, more or less I want to tell you the story of how I came to work with golden images and how it felt to me. So about 18 years ago, um, golden images really were sweet and promising, and I do not know anybody who has not been cheerful about the possibilities um, we saw when we first used those full system images. Because um, it took nothing more than an hour to just back up and restore a, a whole system. The workflow is really easy. You just set up everything you need, all the software, all the configuration, then you shut down the machine, you put in a USB drive or maybe a CD, start a live system, create a copy, then you've got this one file you can transport from one device to another. And in case of a disaster, you just yeah, redeploy this image and you've got everything set up again. And for quite some time, this looked really amazing and we all were cheerful about. The thing is, um, maybe a couple of sysadmins and me, myself, uh, were pretty naive back then because those images were really young and they were sweet and everything was going good and we did not think that things would change a lot. But quite after uh, some time, um, something seemed to change. Um, we realized we were not so happy about those images anymore. Maybe it was our environment that changed or it were our images that should not, did not change when they should have, but things l happened. So configuration and software in our images were outdated. Our images were lacking important security updates. And the validity of those images seemed to have more or less an expiry date. So I'm talking about licensing here or having patches, security fixes, maybe even some group policies that invalidated your passwords or just threw you out of the domain after some time. I think you all know what I'm talking about. So there is more or less uh, yeah, expiry date on the validity. Even if we do sysprep and so, such stuff, um, trust me, it's not the solution. And yeah, it seemed like those images were really rotting from the inside out the older they got. And finally, we had to get rid of them because they were not usable anymore. Maybe those images were just too outdated to use. Maybe our um, hardware changed, so those were incompatible, especially when dealing with Windows environments, and we had to get rid of them. 
We made it. Thank you for staying here. Just let me tell you, there have been twice as many Star Wars slides in the original draft of, the pres of this presentation. So this more or less described uh, the struggle I've been facing with uh, when dealing with golden images. And it took me way longer than I'm proud of, even um, from my Linux boxes, both at, uh, at work and at home, to start using something that's maybe a little more modern, a little more, uh, a little better approach than just creating full system images. So also my Linux boxes, firstly, I just did plain uh, DD copies of the root file system. I tried to keep the root file system nicely small so I could do this quickly. But yeah, I've been dealing with, uh, with uh, systems that were so old, Optimeros were not uh, reachable anymore, and I had to upgrade the systems, and it took me way longer than a new setup would have taken. Sometimes even the upgrades were not possible anymore, rendering the whole system unusable, so a whole setup was um, needed anyway. And this scenario can get troublesome on Linux, so imagine what you would face on a Windows system, let's say from uh, old Windows 2K image or maybe even a uh, XP image and you will want to have some uh, modern software like a Visual Studio 2017 or so in it. So that can get troublesome and it's sometimes not possible so you have to upgrade anyway. Well, in fact, golden images are not that bad either. So there are a couple of good points. Um, golden images are really straightforward and easy to understand because everybody can think of what a copy means. So basically, you've got a system, you've got a copy of it, and you can redeploy this copy. And um, you can do really quick rollers of even the most complex setups, and you've got mostly no dependencies. So you've just got this one file, and you can deploy it by using the same piece of software you used to create the image. On the other hand, those things tend to be really static, so you can't pretty much change an image once it's created. I know there are certain ways to do so, but those are really um, time intensive and also cost intensive in terms of memory and so. Uh, also, what about versioning? Of course, you can assign a version to an image, but what about the software that's inside of that image? You've got different um, IDEs, tools, uh, maybe um, uh, licenses, and you want to be able to track all of those versions most of the times. So a single version number for the image does not uh, fit the job. And of course, I already told about the validity that expires or seems to expire. And for me, those negatives outweigh the positives by a lot. And what we, are not, what we went up with is basically something like this. We've got one large box, which is um, yeah, then our image. And it's a static image with everything that we may need or may not need burned into it. And due to the nature of such full system images, those things tend to get really big. So big in terms of storage. And we do not want to have many of them. So we just pack in more stuff and they tend to get even bigger. Sometimes, or most of the times, I've added different driver sets for different graphic cards so they are more reusable than they are without it. And most of us are not happy with them. Um, on the other hand, this is not good either. <laughs> As a more or less natural counterreaction to having those golden static images, I see a couple of you laughing there. Um, people started to creating uh, inconceivably extensive install instructions. I've seen a lot of uh, wiki pages with, which felt more like uh, old, bad point and click adventures. So uh, now click this, now click that, now fill in the license information here. Do not miss to check that checkbox. And when, once you followed all of these steps, um, it eventually gave you a fully configured system. So we've had that for our development boxes and servers, and let me tell you, this was not a nice thing to have. Obviously, it's a really bad idea also, because if you've got like 20 or 30 development um, hosts and each of the um, developers has to set up his own host, um, you will have 30 different environments. Because if you've installed three pieces of software, this probably will work. But if you're setting up a development box or a server where you've got maybe hundreds of different tasks to do and things to set up, you will error at some time. Sadly, but it's, yeah, error. people are prone to error. So basically what we want to have and what we aim for and what everybody of you probably already does is something like this. We want to have a really small base image, which can be as small as a basic Windows install or even less than that, maybe a Packer, a Vagrant, Docker image, something like that, and we just put our um, applications, our services in there, 
by having uh, the instructions into code. So we want both human and uh, machine readable instructions. Um, we want this because then we cannot uh, miss a step anymore because it's there in the code, the computer does it anyway. And by having those instructions into code, we uh, immediately spot additional advantages, um, like a domain expert for certain pieces of software. Just um, give me a sign if you have uh, had uh, trouble installing Visual Studio from a network share once. Yeah, there are a couple of you. So Windows 2017, great job. It really takes a time to get behind how to do this correctly. And once somebody did this, he can create a setup an install instruction, most likely in PowerShell, and all the co coworkers and other stuff can reuse those instructions. And of course, also if we put those instructions into code, we can do easy versioning. So most of you probably use um, Git or something like that to have all your install instructions versioned nicely. And also, we can have different sets of install instructions. I'd like to refer to them as recipes. So you can combine those recipes. And yeah, they build up on the same really small base images, maybe even a, a pure Windows install, and you do not need an image anymore. And you can combine those recipes for different flavors. Yeah, and basically, that's where chocolatey comes into play. I've tried to uh, create this very look, bizarre looking tech cloud, but believe me, those are not just buzzwords. I'll add a little more context to each of those words shortly. So um, for me, the most important thing about having chocolatey in our development infrastructure, so for both the development hosts and servers, is that we now have repeatable, testable, version-controlled automated deployments. So what does that mean? <laughs> um, first of all, repeatable. It seems pretty straightforward, but there's more to this than just being able to do the same silly setup again and again and again. Um, the thing is, it's easy repeatable as it vastly reduces the cost of repetition. There's no need to apply a full image anymore and patch it up to a valid state. We do not ha need to go to, through hundreds of lines of manual install instructions. Once we've got those um, instructions in code, or let's say even in a just packed them in a chocolatey package, which is pretty easy if you've got a PowerShell script, then you can reapply the same image with a single line of Choco install and you're done. So not image, but software, yeah. And even complex setups. So you, of course, know that you can have package dependencies in Chocolatey. So you can create a meta package that has dependencies to other packages. And you can just uh, create really complex setups and you're able to re uh, re redeploy and repeat the same thing again without any further cost to it. So version controls. Even if you do not have all your chocolatey install scripts and new specs files in version control, which I highly recommend you should do, uh, you still got the uh, versioning that uh, NuGet gives you, which chocolatey is based upon. So by adding the hyphen hyphen version switch uh, on Choco install or Choco upgrade, uh, you can specify which version of a package you want to install. And this is really nice um, in a certain of use cases. Um, just imagine you have a customer who is, for whatever reason, still on Windows XP for a couple of um, PCs or workstations, and you need to patch a software that's running there. I know that for a fact that some companies do that. And you are on Windows 10 with your development host, and you, for yeah, obvious reasons, can't just compile the solution you were shipping five years ago with Windows XP on Windows 7 anymore, uh, on Windows 10 anymore. So what you want to do is now is really easy. You just spin up a virtual machine with Windows XP, and you choco install your um, development environment in that virtual uh, machine. And if your current development in environment does not install, maybe you've got a package which is six months old or even older, which still installs on Windows XP. So this also really comes in handy. Um, just don't forget, if you set up package dependencies, um, keep track of the version. So um, I always like to um, use the exact version in the package dependencies, so this use case gets even better. Um, testable. It works on my machine, does not get you many friends or any friends at all. Uh, we, especially as software developers, have very different setups, have different operating systems, have a lot of virtual machines, and so it's really hard to create a chocolatey package or a setup script that works on all of those machines. And 
what do we do? I like to use Vagrant. Uh, today I've learned about Test Kitchen, which is surely also a great idea. But yeah, up to now I've been using Vagrant. I've got a couple of um, images, Windows 7, 64, and 32 bits. Don't forget about 32 bit Windows. There's still folks out there using it. And let's say Windows Server 2012, 2016, now 2019, and uh, Windows 10, the first version, I think, which is 1503 or 1507. Don't forget about this. There's widget going on there, and the latest version of Windows 10. So um, with all those images, I've set them up to do a Choco install on all packages which are located in a certain folder up on bootstrapping. And this is basically the same thing that the package verifier or package analyzer does on the community repository of Chocolatey. Also, there's this uh, Vagrant image, which is called Chocolatey Test Environment by Rob Reynolds. You can grab this from the Chocolatey repository. And yeah, it's basically the same setup as I already mentioned. So it installs all packages which are in a package folder upon bootstrapping. And you can check if those packages install on that Windows version. And yeah, you just modify the Vagrant file a little to have other Windows versions, and you're good to go. So automated. Don't worry, no Star Wars joke here this time. It just fit the title if you're obsessed as I am. Um, Chocolatey has a really sweet uh, command line interfaces that en aims to integrate everywhere. So Choco has a lot of uh, command line switches that are really great for um, using them in CI servers. And basically all the things you are able to do manually with Chocolatey, it should, it should not be hard to create a PowerShell script um, that does exactly the same and just pl plug that into a CI server. And it does not depend on which CI server you're using because PowerShell is supported pretty good by most of them. So uh, deployments. Here I like to quote Rob Reynolds. He once said, uh, you can't spell software automation without package management. And this really gave me uh, some, uh, something to think about for a while. And for me, it comes down to this. Not having to worry about the different types of installs and configuration mechanisms uh, you need when deploying software really gives you a whole new way of looking at stuff. So um, when you're planning and managing infrastructure, not having to worry about, is this an MSI? Is this an X? Is this a zip file? What parameters do I have to um, include for a SAL installation? It really makes things a lot easier. If I just um, got a package and OK, I need to install this package, and I need to install this package to install, uh, add the configuration for the first package, you're done. It's more or less divide and conquer all over again. So that's something we're used to, and it really yeah, makes things easier. So, um, so good so far. But when um, using chocolate in organizations, there's a couple of other things you may, may want to do as well. And basically, it comes down to security, uh, security reliability, scalability, and reusability, which are more or less um, yeah, a mirror in those uh, bullet points I've put there. Uh, because for security and reliability, you want to have an internal package repository. So uh, the community repository, of course, is great. There are a ton of packages under, thousands and thousands of them. But you want to have them available all the time. You want to have them virus checked. And yeah, you do not want to have arbitrary code um, that comes from the internet executed on your machines at an organization. So you want to have those internally available. Also, you probably want to be able to do an offline installation of Chocolatey, because um, in certain environments, at least at scale engineers, we do not have internet access for really uh, restricted areas. So you want to have that internally as well. Uh, you want to be able to internalize packages, because there are already those great packages out there on the community repository, and you want to be able to reuse them. And of course, you may want to add custom packages. So you can basically uh, deploy your own packages, configuration, licensing, whatever you want. So for internal uh, repositories, there are a lot of choices. I just put my favorite on there. Um, I started off with Chocolatey Server and had a look at Artifactory and just used summer shares for uh, quite some time. So basically, you can have a UNC share and point Chocolatey to there, and it will just find and install packages correctly. But after a while, I used to ProGuard because I wanted all these nice package statistics and the ability to synchronize multiple servers. And also, it gave me a lot of different feed types as well, because I needed Maven and Docker and so on. So ProGuard's great for that. Um, in terms of offline Chocolatey install, it's really easy. Um, you can either just go to chocolatey.org slash install, which is the, I think it's still the correct URL. Yep, Paul Knotts. Uh, just 
um, have a look through this file and replace all those um, download file um, instructions with external URL with URLs pointing to an internal server. Also, I've put some URLs uh, at, the t at the bottom of the presentation where you can have a look at how this is done. Yeah, I'll be talking about later about package internalization and give you an example on how to do it with both Jenkins CI and manually. And yeah, custom packages. We all know PowerShell is really powerful, especially from Windows 7 on, and it's getting better and better with each version of Windows. So you can basically, basically do anything you want. At uh, Case Engineers, we do not only do internal applications, we also do licensing and configurations uh, by applying packages. You can really do anything. I've seen uh, companies that go as far as they, um, cr from their build process, they use N unit and they um, encapsulate those N unit test cases after building them into chocolatey packages. And by doing a choco package install of the test case, they run the test case itself. This all um, spiced up with a little um, pest or, an, or another cool uh, testing framework. It really is great. Um, not pest, sorry, uh, psaka. Pest is for PowerShell test. Um, so, well, anything that can be done with PowerShell. So, um, up to now, I've just been talking about um, how I dislike golden images and how great chocolate he is. Um, but I would not do this presentation without telling you about Boxstarter. Um, Boxstarter is, uh, who has not heard of Boxstarter yet? Okay. Note it, Google it, try it yourself. Um, I always like to refer to Boxstarter as chocolatey on steroids or chocolatey on crack. It's really that good. Um, for me, Boxstarter adds the missing features. Um, chocolate is already great, but there are a couple of things you couldn't, could not do out of the box with chocolatey. And I'll just give you two examples to, see how, uh, to show you how awesome it is. So first of all, Boxstarter can do remote installs out of the box. So you just specify a computer name, a package name, and some credentials you need to um, access the remote host, and you're good to go. So um, this line would install a package on a remote host, and all you need to do is uh, have PowerShell remoting enabled. Yeah, and also the remote host you're installing the package to does not even need to have Chocolatey pre-installed. So Boxstarter comes with its own version of Chocolatey and it pushes it uh, there prior to installing. So that's a really cool feature, but it's not the best. The best feature for me is uh, Boxstarter's reboot resiliency capabilities. So what does that mean? If we have a package that's, or a package setup con uh, consisting of uh, multiple packages, and one of those packages need to reboot, uh, the chain probably would break there because the system needs a reboot and all other um, MSI installs would fail or give us a 16.03 or whatever. And by using Boxstarter, we can um, yeah, bypass that limitation because Boxstarter automatically, automatically detects that there is a reboot pending. It then reboots the computer and also logs into the user that uh, started the installation and continues the um, installation from there on. So um, at Case Engineers, we've got our development box setups, which are about, I think, 80 or 90 packages total. And those uh, setups need to restart four or five times during install. And basically what I do is I say install box starter package. This can even be done remotely. And then I go and grab a coffee because everything else is done um, automatically until the whole process finishes and you've got a ready to use development box. So this is the feature you should definitely check out. Well, isn't this talk supposed to be about golden images? It is. The thing is, um, we used golden images and those huge install instruction manuals earlier, and we do not need them anymore because of all those sweet little features Chocolatey gives us. And I'm going to um, explain the concept of meta packages and why, be, why they're great in my opinion just in a little while. So let's throw in a little CI. We all love our CI servers. And it really does not matter if you're using a Veya, Travis, a Windows Task Scheduler, or Jenkins, whatever. I tend to use Jenkins, nevertheless. And I use the PowerShell and the Build with Parameters plugin for the uh, jobs I'll, I'm about to show you. Yeah, but really it does not uh, matter what you're using. You can just copy those PowerShell lines and pull them in everywhere. They will work as well. 
So if we want, um, yeah, just let's start with the first example. If we want to get an update uh, notified of possible updates, sorry, just let me have a sip of coffee. Slow down a little. So if we want to get notified of possible updates, manu manually we would do something like this. We say Choco outdated. I also I always like the hyphen R switch because it's what I also do in my fully automated jobs. This hyphen R switch is really great as it um, creates those little pipes in between and strips out all the outputs that we do not need. So it creates a really nicely machine readable output. And by using Choco Outdated, you see which package uh, is installed in what version, which version is the latest available, and if it's pinned or not. So you can pin packages so they would not get upgraded, uh, upgraded if you uh, would say Choco Upgrade All. And yeah, there are also other nice switches um, like the no op action if you prefer the Choco upgrade over the Choco outdated command, but that's yeah, just what you prefer. Um, by using Jenkins CI for this upgrade check, um, I've um, created a couple of jobs which you can find on my GitHub repository. There's an URL um, to the repository itself afterwards. Also, um, here I've created a Jenkins job with just three parameters, a mail recipient, a mail sender, and the SMTP server. So this job would just use the choco outdated command, and if there are packages outdated, it will just send me an email or a email to the email recipient what packages are outdated on that specific Jenkins slave the job runs on. So this is very specific to build servers. If we want to do something like that on our development machines or on any host. I always like to point people to the awesome burnt toast PowerShell module, uh, which gives you those nice little notification bubbles in Windows 10 and also sticks to the notification center. So um, if you want to do something like that, I'll be happy to give you a little demo afterwards. It's just about five lines of PowerShell code followed by a new uh, burnt toast notification and that's it. You can also do selection boxes and remind me later and such things. So burn toast is the way to go if you want to show notifications bubbles from PowerShell on Windows 10. So keep that in mind. Um, at Case Engineers, we've gone a step further. I've created an application called Choco Upgrade Notifier. And uh, we can not only check whether there are package updates available and display nice notification bubbles, we can also directly update packages, uh, we can delay updates, we can open Choco GUI, and also um, package statistics and uh, the auditing log with the in, um, available Choco sources are sent to an Elasticsearch server instance, where, which is then easily um, queryable by an Elk stack. So we've got little statistics in the background. So um, this is my PC at work. Currently I've got 143 packages installed. And this is uh, yeah, a screenshot where there is actually one package out of 143 that can be upgraded. And also it sticks to the info center here. So how about automated package internalization? Um, Dan has already been talking about this earlier. And package internalization uh, comes with the choco download command, which is part of the business license. Um, before going for the business license, I've been doing that for a couple of months manually. And, but by using the choco download command from this business license, it's just three lines of PowerShell and you're ready to go. So this is one, two, three. <laughs> I just explained it, it's really just three lines. Uh, first, choco download. Choco download itself would just pull a new package file from the chocolatey repository or any source you can specify here. And the real magic is added by using the hyphen hyphen internalized parameter. Uh, this parameter not, um, unzips the new package after downloading and it skims through the installation files and searches for anything that looks like an URL. It then downloads those artifacts and embeds them into the package so you have them offline available all of the time. If you do not want to have big packages, you can also specify the resource location um, parameter and you can point uh, a folder or a UNC share there, and then those artifacts will be put there. So you can have one yeah, share where all those install artifacts will be put to. Yeah, um, because I'm using this in CI service, I always add a no progress switch, but yeah, that's it. Um, after that, you just do a little selector and grab all of the downloaded new package files. Uh, maybe this part with the select string pattern PKG can even be dropped because um, 
by using this command, not only the package you're looking for, but also all its dependencies are downloaded and inter internalized. And then you'd be better off without this part because you want to be able to select all and push all of the dependencies onto your internal server. And that's the first line of the uh, code. It's just for all of those packages, Choco push that package onto a source with some API key. And you're done. So it's really one, two, three lines of PowerShell code. Of course, this can be done with a CI server as well. So I've created a Jenkins job for this. Uh, this time, I've added a couple of more parameters. So you've got a package list here. You can specify one too many packages, which I think is semicolon uh, 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 split. And you can add a UNC share where those artifacts are put. You can specify a destination folder where the internalized and recompiled new packages are copied to, and of course also an internal destination server and an API key for that server. So why do you want to do that? I already told you I've been doing this for months manually, but uh, consider the time difference. I've just picked out four packages here, VirtualBox, Firefox, Wireshark, and WinPCAP, which is a dependency of uh, VirtualBox as an example, and it took me about 35 minutes to internalize those four packages, and trust me, I've got a lot of experience in manually internalizing packages. And with the Jenkins job, it takes nothing but three minutes, not even three minutes. So if you're internalizing packages on a regular basis, like Dan does, and you've got to do this maybe every second day, your boss will probably go with the business license as mine did as well. <laughs> so um, when you're creating huge uh, setups like I do with dependencies chains with hundreds of packages, beware uh, wrong dependency chains. <laughs> I've uh, stepped into this pitfall a couple of times, to be honest, and it took me way longer, uh, that I'm proud of to know the reason for this. Um, the thing is, usually you create a package for some software, let's say Visual Studio, and later on you're asked to add some configuration to the software. Uh, in a couple of times, I did not think about adding this dependency from the configuration package to the software package itself, and it did not matter because all of the people who already installed the software package were good to go and install the configuration. But once you're bootstrapping a new host with a meta package that has a dependency on both of them, uh, it may be that Chocolate tries to install a config package first or the license package or whatever, and without that dependency, um, part of your setup blows up because this required software is not available at this time. Uh, after all, meta packages are great. I highly recommend you create package structures by using those meta packages. Um, just keep in mind that you set up dependencies correctly and that you also add version information, information if that's possible for you. So where we are now, um, we basically do not need our golden, our static golden images anymore. We try to have very small images and go with yeah, code or with chocolatey packages from there on. So we can have basically this workflow we all want to have. And yeah, that's what I've been doing in the last two or one and a half years at Case Engineers. Currently, we've got approximately 100 internalized packages. Um, I've created about 300 custom packages, which sum up to a total of approximately 3,000 packages, and we've got over 100,000 package downloads. Um, more to that, we've added custom notifications with our Choco Upgrade notifier, and I like to use the term uh, logical application groups, which seems a little nicer than meta packages. So to sum it up, um, we don't need golden images anymore. In fact, most of the times we're far better off without them because we can um, repeat our uh, setups easily. We can test them with virtual machines. Um, the transition was not really hard. In fact, um, I bumped into a couple of errors in the old instruction manuals and wiki pages, and Box Data is definitely awesome, and you should go check it out. So um, that's it for my part. If there are any questions, I'd like to answer them now. Otherwise, here's some contact details. And if you'd like to just go and grab a coffee with me afterwards, and I'll be happy to talk to you. Thanks for this. Is there any question? No one. Okay, then thank you very much.